Hello and welcome to another video. Uh, this is more or less going to be like a follow-up to the last video that I made on pressure engines. Uh, since I've posted that, there's been a lot of development, and I mean a lot of development within the uh, the technical community and SMSCI. Um, we understand a lot more about them. We understand how they work, all of that stuff. All of the information that currently exists is going to go in a much more dedicated video that's going to be very technical and get into all the math, all the science, exactly how they work, why they work, what they do to make themselves work. This is just going to be a general kind of a rephrasing of my introduction um, with the newfound knowledge. So what is a pressure engine? How is it different from a normal engine? Well, a normal engine, uh, obviously it extends and contracts the piston in a cyclical manner to produce rotation about a crankshaft. This is similar, um, but unlike most engines where you need timing, timing advancement, uh, things like that, none of that is needed. But in a lot of hidden ways, they can be much more dynamic. Um, the basic principle by which a pressure engine works is what I've dubbed the pressure effect, where I'm sure anybody is familiar with joint stretch, where the, the joint, the piston, is, its task is to restrict two bodies, two objects a parent upon which the joint is placed and a child upon which it is placed to the joint. This exhibits a bound. The uh, child object is free to move forward and backward according to the piston, but it is not free to move side to side. Now this isn't entirely true. You can offset a block to the side of a piston if you exert enough force. It re does require a tremendous amount of force, but it is nonetheless something you can do. That is the bound. There exists one at the end of a piston's allowed travel and one behind a piston's allowed travel as well. When you exceed that bound, when you start to push a block away from the axis, it's intended to move along, it produces an enormous amount of force to resist this. Um, and th again, this exists forward and backward as well. Now, along the length that the piston travels, there's a specified speed upon which it completes that travel. If you exceed that speed, it will produce a force similar to the bounding force to restrict it. and get it back to that original set speed, whether it's the maximum allowed or the minimum allowed or anywhere in, in between. It will try to assume that speed. <clears throat> if you uh, use a controller to give a custom speed and you met, you modify the JSON on the controller, you blueprint edit the controller or edit edit the value, the speed value, you can essentially give the piston a an infinite target speed or seemingly infinite target speed. And what this does is essentially allows the child object to go to any speed it so desires. And returning to the speed element, this is present when you compress a piston beyond its bound as well. If you push a piston backwards, encroaching on that bound where it would produce an enormous amount of force to return it not only to the starting place of its bound it also does so with a damping speed with a, a damping force proportional to its velocity this is true for any joint even a bearing if you offset a bearing away from itself and you let it return there will be a damping to it it won't just bounce back and forth continuously it will it will return rather poignantly since this has essentially been removed, since the speed restriction has essentially been removed with a piston, the uh, force that you can experience, well, if you compress a piston enough with it on a fast controller and it hits that, it hits that bound, it will attempt to return to its current location 
and it will do so with whatever force it deems necessary. And since there's no damping, it will overshoot. It will return with an exorbitant amount of force. So the basic principle behind the engines is with some amount of initial energy, you can compress a piston, you can push it inside of itself, hit that bound, and it will rebound. And since the speed-related damping has essentially been disabled, all of that force goes back into your crankshaft and goes back into compressing the piston for the next power stroke. Now, since this does require a minimum amount of energy, you do need an external power source to start it. But once it's running, it's running. Part of the property of this cycle is it will sink to the physics engine. It will sink to the rate at which physics happens. Um, and for some complicated math and reasons that is outside the scope of this right now, it is essentially fixed for any engine. Uh, there are designs that can exist between certain speeds, uh, but for the most part, it's determined by geometry. The, vi the engine in the video that I displayed initially, uh, that rotated at a fixed speed. This one here also rotate rotates at a fixed speed, but this one's much higher. Part of the geometric elements when designing a pressure engine are they very they like very high conrod conrod ratios. Um, this is due to the longer it is, the more parallel the force impulse and uh, force transfer back to the piston head it will be throughout its rotation. Um, and this gets better and better the longer you make it. <clears throat> we can see here that it is able to compress the piston backwards. And if I type in a command to restrict my frame rate, you, we can see uh, it's sinking to the it's sinking to the physics tick rate. Since these rotate at a fixed speed, it is rather hard to uh, harness their power effectively. Like in a car, where you need the, the speed of the wheels to change dynamically. That is where we have a, a double bearing gas clutch integrated into the system, where the engine is essentially providing a static amount of torque. I say essentially, it does change. But... It's essentially providing a static torque at a fixed speed, and we're able to control some percentage of that torque that gets sent to the wheels. <clears throat> this is this inherently means there's a loss of power, but it's mitigated by the fact that the force we're tapping into is extremely powerful. Whereas uh, most engines, most conventional engines, can get up to... 30 to 40 horsepower per piston, these can exceed 2,000 and in theory hit uh, 2.5 uh, thousand horsepower per piston. So these are very, very powerful engines. Uh, even, even including a 70% loss in power uh, to the wheel. Now, this engine here, this does not make 2,000 horsepower. This doesn't make anywhere near 2,000 horsepower. I can even stop this with my lift. Um, the ways to improve engine performance would be using zeroth blocks that don't have any collision to make the conrod. So the intense vibrations from the very long conrod moving so quickly, that's all mitigated. So, and with this design, with both pistons, um, 180 degrees apart, they fire at the exact same time. So the change, the change in velocity from the uh, cylinder head, I guess you would call it, is essentially uh, nothing. The only vibrations left are the secondary weight to the conrod to make sure it has the inertia you desire, and the fact that it is a very distinct impulse of power. So the RPM of the crankshaft has its own vibrations. Uh, 
where it's accelerating and slowing down really, really quickly. Um, <clears throat> again, I just I have a single cylinder here to demonstrate the effect, but a you know, boxer configuration is typically the most desired configuration. There are some exceptions uh, where you don't want a boxer, but generally speaking, boxers are the most stable because they can mitigate mitigate most of those vibrations. Some of the elements of construction are the use of floating pass-throughs. We can see here that the piston is placed between two wedges. Uh, this is such so that the bounding box of this wedge will not interfere with this wedge when it collides with it. Well, it doesn't collide with it. It slides right past it. That's what allows the piston to get compressed so far. There are various ways of achieving this. We can use the corner of a wires piece. We can place a piston with any pipe piece you desire or a block. Uh, but at least for my designs, I use pistons. Now, you can use zero width blocks as you, if you want. But at least my personal designs, I use these two distinct wedges. For the crankshaft, uh, you typically use the wires piece. There are other methods of constructing floating pass-throughs. I wouldn't use one of these uh, ramps for a floating bearing pass-through, though, as these small pipes ever so slightly rub on the inside of the collision. It's not necessary. For, it's not noticeable for most applications, uh, unless you really care about collision losses and whatnot. Uh, and if, if this looks frightening to you, uh, rest assured, this is a 100% normal property that these exhibit. And if you if you can look at the right, the exact right spot, you can place them. And what allows this to work is that the this area does not have does not have collision, and neither does the joint itself. <coughs> um. This engine here, if you're wondering, makes about uh, 2,000-ish horsepower in total. I think it's a little over that. It's not a very efficient engine. It's one of my first of the smaller kind. Um, this is a much this is a much newer car, and I don't want to quite show too much of its inner workings. Uh, but this has two engines that are single cylinders. Um, and it's, I think each engine is outputting about 1,400 ish horsepower. With the loss rate, it drops to about 650 horsepower to each wheel. Uh, and due to the, the high RPM that these engines, engines can exhibit, this car can get up to over 380 kilometers an hour. And... I suppose I can demonstrate that without showing too much. It uses a, a standoff to start the engines. Part of the downsides of these is they like having very heavy flywheels. So in a vehicle, the intense uh, process, procession force uh, can really come at the expense of the, perf of the performance of a vehicle. And this is not, this is not the fastest car in SM. The current land speed record is 590 kilometers an hour uh, held by Ben Bingo. You can go find him and talk to him on the Scrap Mechanic Technical Community uh, Discord server. And you can learn about uh, how to build these and the math behind them in person from me, Ben Bingo, Kind Anderer, uh, and several other experienced uh, builders. But that's just a, uh, that's just the gist, that's just the overview. There's a whole world of fancy math uh, that goes into exactly how these work the way they do that I'm going to cover next. So for now, uh, that'll be all.